A lot can change in 70 years. But what do you think 70 years means in terms of development of the saxophone? Has anything really changed? How does an instrument like this, a Selma super balanced action manufactured all the way back in 1948, compare to this? A Selma Super Action 80 Series 3, a model introduced in the late 90s, but still sold today and even described by Selma as the latest model in their range. In this video, I'm gonna do a deep dive into these two beautiful instruments. But before we get into it, if you're just starting out on the saxophone and you're not sure where to start, check out the Sax Tuition Beginner Series. You can watch lesson one for free right here on YouTube, and I've put a link to that in the description below. So let's get into it. 1948, it was the year that Britain created the NHS, the first NASCAR race was held, and according to the serial number on the back of this saxophone, the year this beautiful Selma super balanced action was assembled in Selma's factory in the suburbs of Paris. At the time, this saxophone was designed as a replacement for the Selma Balanced Action, which had already made a big leap forward from its predecessor in terms of ergonomics and playability. The biggest new feature in this saxophone though, the introduction of offset tone holes. Prior to this model, saxophones were designed with the left hand and the right hand tone holes in a straight line. The SBA's introduction of the offset tone holes meant that the hands and wrists of the player were in a much more natural playing position, making playing the saxophone more comfortable and more effortless. It's the difference between this and this. Did you catch that? This and this. Now, the model that Selma would manufacture after the super balanced action was the legendary Mark VI. And even though it's often credited as being the final form of the modern saxophone, many of the improvements on that model were already present on this guy right here. After the Mark VI came the Mark VII, and then in 1981, Selma released the Super Action 80. What I have here is the Selma Super Action 80 Series 3, the most up-to-date model of their most modern saxophone. Now, here's where things get a little confusing. Back when the Super Balanced Action was released, it actually wasn't called the Super Balanced Action. It was called the Super Action. It was only after Selma released the Super Action 80 that Selma and the saxophone community as a whole started referring to the super action as the super balanced action to avoid any confusion with their newest model. Super balanced action, super action 80. Whew, glad we got that out of the way. Now let's take a moment to appreciate how beautiful these saxophones really are. Now this SBA is what we'd call a player's horn and it's typical of so many vintage saxophones available today in that it's not in its 1948 showroom condition, but it's in great mechanical condition and it still sounds absolutely fantastic. It's also a re-lacquer, meaning that at some point a previous owner stripped off the original lacquer when it began tarnishing and re-lacquered the instrument so it looked all shiny and new again. Of course, these days the sax is far from shiny, so we can assume that the re-lacquering itself was done a long time ago, perhaps even as early as the 60s or 70s. So then how could we even tell that it's a re-lacquer in the first place? Well, if you look closely at the engraving on the bell, you'll notice that it's faded quite a bit and that the grooves themselves aren't as deep. That's a dead giveaway of the relacquering process. And of course, it is a shame because the original engraving on this SBA is absolutely beautiful. As a player's horn though, what we really care about is the sound, which we'll talk about in just a moment. There's also a lot of other interesting information that we can get from inspecting this saxophone, starting with the serial number. By referencing this against Selma's own records, we can tell that this saxophone was an early SBA, manufactured in the first year that the model was introduced. 
It's also a totally foolproof way to tell what the actual model of this saxophone is, since super action is not explicitly engraved anywhere on this saxophone. Another fantastic, very antiquated piece of engraving on this sax says, Sole Agent, British Empire, X Canada, Selma, London. In other words, this sax was assembled in Paris, sent to Selma's office in London, who had responsibility for distributing their instruments across the British Empire, who then distributed it to Canada. The guy who I bought this sax from purchased it from Roberto's, which is a famous sax shop in New York, who then brought it all the way back to Australia, where I picked it up after he had it for about 10 or 15 years. So this sax has done some serious traveling in its time, and that's just from what I can piece together. This saxophone would have had multiple repads over its life, and right now it's sporting a full set of pads made from, you guessed it, kangaroo leather. Apart from being very appropriate for an Australian sax player, Roo pads are actually some of the highest quality, longest lasting pads that you can buy. They're also easy to spot because they're all black. The final piece about this sax that I find interesting is the neck. It's a brass neck that's been plated in silver. Did this neck originally come from another saxophone or did a previous owner somewhere along the line decide to plate this neck in silver when they re the rest of the instrument? This is actually a hard question to answer, but I know that it is generally accepted that silver plating can change the sonic characteristics of an instrument, even just on the neck. Which, of course, brings us to our next horn. My silver plated Super Action 80 Series 3. Why did I get a silver plated sax? Well, the honest truth is that my teacher at the time had one and I wanted to be just like him. This sax is a real beauty, but compared to other saxes on the market, it's also fairly understated in terms of its appearance. On the bell, we see the classic floral engraving we come to expect on modern professional saxophones. But unlike some other models like those from Yanagisawa, it's relatively modest by comparison. There's still some blank space used between the patterns. Also on the bell, we see the Selma Paris logo, made in France, and the Series 3 model designation. The serial number, whilst useful for insurance purposes, doesn't give us an exact year when the saxophone was manufactured, as Selma hasn't made that information publicly available for the Series 3. Judging by when I bought it though, I would say it was most likely around 2003. The keys themselves, as standard for professional saxophones, are made from Mother of Pearl, and I think that the quality that Selma selects tends to be amongst the best of any modern professional saxophone. All the keys are quite brilliant to look at. Visually though, my favorite thing about this saxophone has to be the blue S logo on the neck. This was actually a design cue that started in the Mark VI era of Selmer's, and I think it's such a brilliant and subtle piece of advertising on Selmer's part. I also love it because, funnily enough, the S kind of reminds me of that cool S that kids used to draw in school. So it may not be extravagant, but the Super Action 80 Series 3 has all the visual appeal and quality finish that we'd expect from a professional saxophone. Which leads us to the next question. How different do these two saxes actually sound? <laughs>
Guys, at this point, I'd love to know which saxophone sound you prefer, the SBA or the Series 3. So leave your thoughts in the comment section below. To me, even though I have such an undying affection for the Series 3, it is after all the very first saxophone that I ever properly owned. The SBA has that classic jazz sound of the 40s and 50s that I absolutely love. It doesn't quite cut through as much as the Series 3, at least in my opinion, but it has a certain character about the sound. I feel as though this saxophone is leading me in terms of the tonal direction that I'm going to take. The Series 3, on the other hand, feels like it's more led by the player. It's like a wonderful blank canvas that you can start to paint over. The tone is clear and it's clean and it's direct. The intonation is spot on and you could use it for jazz and pop just as easily as you could for serious orchestral playing. Some people will find the SBA quite restrictive in terms of the tonal palette you can achieve, whilst others will be happy to hone in on one particular sound. I think it's also important to mention that we're comparing a silver plated saxophone to a regular lacquered saxophone. Now there's some debate in the saxophone community about how much difference the material saxophones made from or the plating it receives actually impacts your sound. And whilst everyone basically agrees that it does make a difference, the points people argue about are really just trying to find the words to describe that difference. The way I think about silver plated saxophones is that it gives you a slightly more complex sound. Rather than a very focused, direct sound, it's like you're getting some warmer lows and mids at the same time you're getting extra brightness too. So the sound is just a little bit more spread out. It's so hard to put words to it though. It's just something that when I hear another silver plated saxophone, I go, ah yeah, there's that sound again. None of that though takes away from the tonal identity of this horn in that it could really be a bit of a chameleon. Now in the final part of this video, I want to give you a sense of how these saxophones actually feel to play. Because if there's one thing that could certainly give the newer sax the edge over the older sax, it's ergonomics. The first thing to note is that the SBA is quite a bit lighter than the Series 3. It's 2.3 kilograms for the SBA and 2.7 kilograms for the Series 3. For a bit of perspective, that's a can of beans difference between the two saxophones. That's a lot of extra metal. And you can feel it just by placing your hands on the saxophone. The Super Action 80 feels more sturdy and rigid. The SBA feels a lot more malleable. You get the sense straight away that the SBA is going to need some pretty serious TLC to keep it in top playing shape and avoid having to get it frequently adjusted by a woodwind technician. That being said, I love the lightness of the SBA and I'm convinced that the lightness and the malleability of it has to have an impact on the ability of the saxophone to resonate. And I think it helps to give it its unique sound. Once we take a close look at these two saxophones, we'll also start to see a number of subtle differences in terms of key placement. The first thing I notice is the octave key placement. To me, the placement of the octave key is in a much more natural playing position on the Series 3 than it is on the SBA. It's also interesting to note that the thumb rest on the SBA is domed, whereas on the Series 3, it's wide and flat. And once again, I think the approach taken on the Series 3 is more intuitive and more comfortable to play on. If we look down at the low E flat and C keys, you'll notice on the Series 3, these keys are wider and are sloped in such a way to encourage that pinky finger to rest closer to the rollers. And I suppose it also helps to prevent the finger from slipping off the key entirely during faster passages. The chromatic F sharp key on the Series 3 is in an elongated shape rather than the smaller circular shape on the SBA, so it's more forgiving for the player since it's a key that's not used very often. The high F sharp key on the Series 3, well, it exists. This was not a feature on the SBA, and it's a favourite particularly for classical players who want to play very clean, clear high F sharps without using an altissimo fingering. 
Another major ergonomic difference I noticed are the side keys. Notice how the side keys are sloped on the Series 3 as opposed to the SBA. That small difference in key placement makes a big difference during playing. I've always felt a lot more confident playing fast passages hitting these keys on the Series 3 than the SBA where there's less margin for error. Of course, more time spent playing on the SBA would reduce this feeling significantly. On the left hand pinky cluster, Notice how the C sharp and low B flat keys are actually connected together, making moving around these keys with the rollers just that little bit easier. Also, the palm keys are more spaced apart on the Series 3. On the SBA, they're in more of a vertical line. Once again, at least in my opinion, the placement of the palm keys on the Series 3 makes more ergonomic sense to me, and they don't feel as fiddly to play. Now, before I give you my final thoughts about these two beautiful saxophones, I want to just point out one thing. These are professional instruments for serious players. And by the time you get to that stage in your playing, you're already likely to have an idea about the tone that you're going for and how the sax is going to be used. Now, earlier in the video, I described this SBA as a player's horn. And one thing that serious sax players are usually always sensitive to is price. After all, there aren't too many multi-millionaire saxophone players around. As I mentioned, this sax is a relacquer. And whilst it's lost its beautiful engraving, in my opinion, it's retained its beautiful sound. Being a relacquer scares off most of the wealthy collector types, but in return, you get a sax that you could pick up for around $4,000 instead of closer to $8,000 for a mint condition version. The Series 3, on the other hand, you can pick up new for about $6,500, which actually makes it the more expensive option. So if you're looking for something rock solid with great ergonomics, excellent intonation, and a clean, clear sound that would suit a variety of genres, the Series 3 would be the best option. But if you're looking for that undeniable jazz sound of the 40s and 50s, and you're prepared to give this saxophone some extra TLC, the SBA can't be beat. Well, I'd love to know your thoughts on these two amazing saxophones. If you've been lucky enough to play them yourself, or if you're just judging them from this video, leave your thoughts in the comment section down below. And remember, if you're just starting out on the saxophone and you're looking for some clear direction, on what to practice and which songs to learn, check out the Sax Tuition Beginner Series. You can watch Lesson 1 right here on YouTube or head to saxtuition.com to download the entire series immediately after purchase. There's 12 lesson videos, a 68 page ebook and over 200 demo tracks for you to play along with. Well, thanks again for watching and supporting the channel. Hit like and subscribe to the Sax Tuition YouTube channel for more great saxophone content. And of course, I'll see you all again soon.